So I would like to now invite our next speaker, Dr. Pearly Yan from the James Cancer. Dr. Yan. Thank you so much for the opportunity to, uh, for me to be able to speak a little bit of what I do uh, in the Cancer Center. But I think it's just a perfect introduction that Kun was talking about team science. And, and this is actually my first slide. Um, this is better so that you can actually see me. I'm too short. Um, so for, um, I, I couldn't emphasize the point sufficiently that f when we do uh, works that involves a lot of large data sets, this is really uh, big science. And big science needs to have a team. And um, I, I am just but one of the person, and um, Dr. Bunshu will be the next speaker, so he will talk about the data analysis component of the work we do uh, on top of uh, the other uh, uh, analysis, that, uh, research interests of, uh, that he has. Um, very importantly, I need collaborators. And um, one of the main strengths that I will talk about later on in uh, OSU is the study of epigenetics. And we have a group of clinician scientists that's very interested in studying that uh, area and provide us, us with valuable patient material. They are well annotated, they are well curated. And um, during our data analysis stage, we have our computation collaborators. We have the BMI uh, collaborators that provide us with uh, very fast turnaround time for primary data analysis and secondary data analysis, and when we, we also collaborate in um, big projects as well. Uh, we also need, um, so uh, Katie is about statistician. When, when we have work that uh, associated with CalGB, she will be part of that. And we also have OSU Cancer Center's IT team to help us maintain one of our data visualization uh, platform, which at the end I'll show what it's capable of doing. Um, funding that's very important. So we have uh, the ongoing uh, Cancer Center Support Grant. We have uh, the SPORE Grant and the Cal CalGB Grant that provide us uh, with money to study large patient cohorts. And we also uh, relied on the Ohio Supercomputing Center to do our downstream data analysis. This is a team. We have biologists and uh, self-trained bioinformaticians. We have uh, undergraduate students that later on turned to be our staff member. They are um, engineering students and biophysics students. So we come from all walk of life. For those of you who were here to listen to our first speaker, Dr. Austin, talks about the importance of teamwork, and, and we do have that going on. So I just want to have a quick, uh, give you a quick outline of what I'm going to talk about. I, I just want to briefly touch upon how high throughput sequencing is connected with personalized medicine. We have the P4 medicine on campus here. I think every year we have an annual meeting on that. That's a very important direction our cancer center is taking. One of the strengths that we can contribute to the P4 medicine, I believe, it's actually looking at the DNA methylation profile of different, of different dis disease tissues. I'll talk a little bit about that. I'll talk about, I, I probably it's gonna skip this. this we, we gain so much knowledge as we work with our users, both computationally as well as from the bench, that we would like to share that information with other groups that's willing to, uh, that, that would like to also study the methylome. And, um, it's very important that we know how to take the maximum advantage of generating good quality data and a lot of it. So I have a little bit on that. And finally, I would like to talk a little bit of other things that we're good at doing in, on, on top of DNA methylation. Um, so this is what we call the obligatory slide when we talk about next generation sequencing. So this is the Moore's Law. We talk about uh, the increase in memory uh, in our computer chips. And the doubling time is 18 months. And the increase in data throughput in next generation sequencing way surpassed that. And the doubling time of the data that we can generate, it's actually every 4.3 months. So we are right at here. We have our Illumina sequencing uh, uh, instrument on campus. Over the weekend, we finished one of our pair and flow cell, and one of the lane give us 406, uh, sorry, 260 million pieces of, in, uh, of information. For those of you who probably are, are, are familiar with Sanger-based sequencing, when you submit a 384 well plate, 
you've got 384 pieces of information. So kind of imagine if you get 260 million pieces of information. That's a lot of information. So this is the instrument that we have. And it's being housed in, the, in this building, second floor, room 291. I have an open office policy. Please swing by anytime. Uh, just catch me or one of my team members, and we would be very happy to walk you through both the instrument, what the instrument can do, and what the computation that we're involving in. Um, so my, there's two slides I like to kind of um, talk about personalized medicine. This one is from a neighbor university in the south. I thought this is kind of catchy. Um, uh, Vanderbilt University has started the personalized medicine since 2008, so um, they have done quite a bit of work. This is uh, a university from the neighbor from the north, which I'm not going to name names. Um, so this is actually a very interesting um, project. So. Um, so once again, this particular circle is talk about team science. Whenever we have big sciences, we need people with very distinct expertise to come together, and everyone is vested into the process of learning how to produce uh, answers for our patients. They try and uh, get patients' consent to uh, uh, raw data to analyze data and turn it back to the patient in 27 days. The timeline is important because this represents when patients come back for revisits. They want it to be a good experience, they make the timeline into 27 days. So what they are doing is actually a very clever one. What they do is they want to sequence the genome very shallowly. Sequencing the genome is still expensive, even though we are really at very close at the cusp of doing a $1,000 genome. But it's still expensive, so they do shallow whole genome sequencing to catch large structural variations in the genome. Then they use exon to capture the coding region of the genome. In that case, they can sequence it very deeply, and they look for SNPs. And these are highly covered, so they have a lot of confidence in their SNP calling. And then lastly, they want to look at the downstream effect of what the whole gen uh, the structural variation and the SNPs, what is the downstream effect, so they do whole uh, uh, RNA sequencing. So by doing that, they are able to come up with um, seeing what is actually the culprit of causing the disease. Okay. So as I was saying that our, uh, at OSU, we are very um, blessed with a lot of researchers who's interested in epigenetics. Kun was just talking about uh, chip, uh, chip sequencing. Um, there is uh, one of the other facet of epigenetics, it's DNA methylation. So the genome uh, we are born with, however, through our lifetime, our epigenome changes as we are exposed to the insult from the environment. For example, even in twins, right, they have identical genetic material. Over the lifetime, this particular facet changed, so the susceptibility to disease, it's different at, you know, when, when someone turns 40 or 50. A pair of twins will have different susceptibility. So this, this particular uh, DNA methylation happens on the fifth uh, cytosine, and it can add a methylation group. This, uh, it is a reversible state, and it's targetable by drugs, and that's why it is very enticing for us to uh, study that particular facet. Uh, however, 5-methylcytosine by themselves in terms of sequencing right now with the uh, first and second generation sequencing, we cannot tell them apart. So we have to use some kind of trick to, as a readout to tell us about DNA methylation. Just want to show you some of the recent paper uh, that's surrounding DNA methylation from very basic science into, um, into uh, methodology, into uh, uh, clinical translational study into personalized medicine. It is an area that has a lot of interest, and I believe we can contribute greatly to that. And um, so about two years ago, uh, a group in Harvard kind of study the two type of methods that's important in, stu in studying DNA methylation. Those that use a chemical to turn methylation into a, dis uh, into a, into a into something that we can discriminate between the methylated state and the unmethylated state. And this is at a single base resolution. We can actually tell uh, about that methylation. And this is a sequence capture method. And 
I'll, basically, the recommendation is that, I guess I might just want to point it out to you. This is actually the method that we decided upon. It's an enrichment base. And they find that it's just as good in identifying differential methylated regions as something that it takes a lot more sequencing and a lot more effort to do. And uh, this is the basic workflow. I'm not going to go through that. And um, so just want to touch on two, two points about what is a successful um, uh, analysis. Firstly, of course, I've mentioned that we want, we want a lot of data. So if you kind of can look at this particular column, this is the, this is the lane of uh, sequencing that uh, we, did, we did over the weekend that has 260 million reads, tons of reads, and they are good quality reads as well. And secondly, um, the, cost at, the cost and the speed of creating sequencing data has gone down dramatically. However, computationally, um, it is very expensive and it's not a fast process. So we really want to make sure the data that go on to analysis be of good quality. Otherwise, we're just increasing the noise in a big study and decreasing the signal. So uh, uh, throughout our experience with um, methylation analysis, we come up with some very useful, sorry, keep on ching, some, some very useful guidelines in terms of how to screen for um, uh, good quality data and then maybe just set aside data that's not so good. Um, I'm going to quickly um, just skip some of the, uh, and, and go to the very end. Uh, if we have time uh, during the discussion section, I can, t uh, I can come back uh, to uh, some of these slides that we talk about. Um, uh, about how to actually get things done here. So some of our other uh, expertise is that we have gained a lot of inf knowledge on how to generate good quality RNA-seq data and how uh, and, and good quality data and then uh, also small RNA uh, data. Importantly, for us to turn analyzed data to our bi biolog biologist uh, user, we need to be able to allow them to look at the data uh, at a very uh, easy way. So we, uh, we have the OSU IT team has uh, helped us curate a visualization uh, platform that's called NOJ that you can either look at the raw data or you can look at the synthesized data that we turn them into a, a heat map scale so that you can drag along the entire genome at will. You can type in the gene of interest and you can find them. So it's really, really helpful to our biologist friend. And I think that is the end of my presentation. Thank you.